Bonjour, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. Uh, my name is Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by Mr. Demo Rabion and Saul Ramirez from Asba Drums. Welcome, guys. Bonjour. Thank you Monsieur. for having us. <laughs> Bonjour. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's the only French I'm going to do, and I butchered it already. So, um. No, it's so good. <laughs> so this is a cool one, guys, because um, I think Asba Drums... People in North America, where I'm located, uh, in the drum world know about you guys, and there's a lot of history, and uh, the company goes back, I believe, to 1927. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, Absolutely. exactly. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's you're coming up on 100 years, I mean, which is incredible. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, five years apart from, yeah, <laughs> we are a century. Wow. I mean, you're... We'll round up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we really cross. Let's and, say uh, already 100 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Can, we can do that, yeah. So, but very interesting. And and uh, there's different generations of the company and everything. But I, I will say right up front, you guys are both in uh, demo, as you put, the commercial department. And you guys both wear a bunch of different uh, hats and do different things with ASBA. So um, we're going to hear from both of you today. But to start, demo, why don't you jump in here and just tell us about the origins of the company and uh, how it all started with ASBA in 1927. So it all started with uh, Alfred and Simon Bouda, uh, which are the, the owners. Uh, so they are, you know, the initials for ASBA, ASBA. It's Alfred Simon Bouda Accessories. Um, they started to create accessories back in the day. Um, that was mostly for theaters, uh, you know, like a trumpet, uh, you know, mutes and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then slowly they started to create more into uh, percussion, you know, percussion world like congas and bongos. Of course, there was the war in between. So, you know, there was like a, a break and uh, they were back uh, after World War II with the uh, making and building drums. So it's really, it really is about accessories and, uh, you know, everything about theaters and, and, and shows back in Paris. Um, yeah. There used to be in Limay Brevan, it's really near Paris, like the suburb. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really like kind of um, just a shot in the dark because Alfred was just, you know, trying to, he was a violinist. So basically he was not a drummer. And mm. so, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and being a musician, you know, he wanted to put his instruments somewhere when he was, you know, starting the rehearsal or finishing the rehearsal. He needed like a stand, you know, something to put, you know, the violin. And he created the first stand for a violin. And little by wow. little, yeah, step by step, he created more uh, stands for you know, all the accessories for guitars, for pretty much everything. And friends of him, you know, were re requiring like for, for more of this kind of hardware, you know, um, you know, accessories. And so that was the first, uh, you know, that was the beginning of the, the ASBA history. And Interesting. That's, that's why the, the A of accessories in ASBA. Well, that's uh, pretty common from from my memory of doing other episodes where like ah, I'm going to forget some, but I believe like Tama drums out of Japan started uh, with just making accessories. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Meinl had something to do along those lines where it was companies that would make other uh, accessories for other instruments. And then it sort of just works out over the years that they end up doing uh, drum stuff so so exactly. to begin with though it was yeah. no drums it was just were they doing drum accessories no drums. at all or wow. no drums yeah interesting no drums at all yeah, yeah yeah no drums at all they're really like the the first like kind of drum was like i mean congos and, and bongo you know no bongos and congas sorry uh that was the first really instrument you know uh, yeah percussion instruments okay yeah mostly yeah so back in that time period in like the 20s and things like that, uh, I assume a big job for drummers would be to be performing in those like cabarets and theaters and things like that. Um, like here in America, it was a lot of a big deal was performing with um, the silent movies and adding the soundtrack. Was that going on in France? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he was. Yeah, they were they were doing the same. I mean, it was like a parallel universe because, uh, you know, really like 
the U.S. were always, uh, you know, the groundbreaking uh, innovation uh, back in the day. They were, you guys were always the first to create things. Uh, but at this point, uh, we were doing also uh, and building, you know, this kind of accessories uh, for movies, for theaters. And uh, we were in the same, you know, I think same uh, momentum in a way. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, now, before we move even further, what were you guys? So here in, in the States, a lot of the factories pivoted to make other things during World War II. Uh, it's a completely different situation f for you guys in World War II as opposed to here where the there was no war on American soil or whatever. What was the ASBA? Was the ASBA factory cr producing things during the war or was no. it just shut down? No, yeah. they shut down. Yeah. Okay. That makes Absolutely. sense because here a lot of things would be instead of making um, drums, you're now making the gauges that go on an airplane oh, or you're yeah. now making war related yeah. items, oh, which is uh, yeah. interesting subject. So, all right. So we then get through the war. What happens from there? Because, I mean, then again, we're in the 40s. Music has changed. You know, yeah. I mean, jazz is everywhere. Where, where do we go from there? So, Keep yeah, on. actually, it's uh, what happened with Asba, Asba after the war is that at 98, 48 is when they started doing drums, actually. And that's when they did the first snare that is it's called the Snare Revelation, um, that it was co-created with a teacher from the Conservatoire de Paris that the, uh, this guy was playing actually with um, La Garde Republicaine, that's how you call it in French, that was actually like... Uh, how do you call it? Republican um, guards, you know? The, yeah, the Republican guards yeah. that were playing okay. like in snares. Sure. And it was quite groundbreaking back at the time because this snare had a um, parallel, uh, how do you call that in English? Du a dual um, throw off? Yeah, throw off. Throw off. Okay. Yeah. And that was the beginning of the drum history with Asba, actually. Uh, and also because uh, Jassy was coming a lot in, in France and more in Paris. Uh, there was more demand of this type of drums or or this or this market. Very beautiful drums. I mean, the snare is so cool looking. Were they like making all the parts in house? Were they like creating yeah. a steel shell and all that stuff? Everything, everything wow. from A to Z was French, like literally. That's awesome. You don't hear about that nowadays of America or any country. You don't really hear about like car companies or something. You don't hear about anything that's made all in one place. That doesn't happen no. anymore, really. So <laughs> not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it really popular right off the bat? I mean, were people, did people love the drum and it become popular in France? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We had a lot of, uh, you know, ads, uh, convention and, and, and stuff all around music. The, the bebop, the jazz was pretty much, you know, more and more famous, uh, and we were, you know, European uh, in a way, like inspired by the American for a lot of stuff. You know, you were talking about cars, but, you know, we were inspired by cars. Even if we created the cars, you guys took over. And, <laughs> you know, for, for the movie industry, the same. But for music, you guys really were the inspiration for us. So that's the, the funny thing. Like you inspired Asba back in the day and... Asba then inspired all the brands, uh, all, all the drum brands for innovate, innovation, you know, and, and new yeah. new things. So that was, you know, that was like, a, yeah, really cool in a way. Yeah, it's very like, uh, uh, it's just interesting with the drum world like that, like very mutual, like um, you work on this and they, they build off each other. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Now, was was Asba being sold, let's say, in the f late 40s? I'm looking at your timeline here. I should say to everyone <laughs> listening, asbadrums.com, A-S-B-A drums.com. There is a really cool timeline um, that, that kind of breaks this all down uh, very simply. And there's pictures that'll be in the description. So if you're listening or watching this, um, you can check that out and follow along. But was Asba being distributed uh, in France and other European countries, or had it made any um, jump over to the United States at that point? Well, there were, there were, we had distributors in Europe, in Sweden, I believe. Uh, but in the States, that was totally different. Uh, we were shipping stuff. And, you know, that was not like nowadays where you have, you know, 
uh, transportation carriers like you know a lot of choice. Yeah, you can ship whatever you want. In you know, in, it's it, it was really different. It was kind of manual stuff. You know, it was really, uh, uh, but really genuine too because people that would order Asba from the states uh, would really want the products. You know, would really want to be different and to have something exotic in a way. So yeah, that was a different you know approach of the the business. And if I can add, also, it's more like in the 60s, 70s, when ASBA was more present in the United States. During the 40s and 50s, it was more like in Europe, we'll say, perhaps. Um, but back at the time, ASBA was present actually in almost uh, 15 countries, if I'm right, all over Europe, in the United States, in Canada. And even you could, you could find some ASBA products like in places like Brazil for the Congas. And, yeah. and you can still find some like vintage Asba products even in Africa. Not long ago, we spoke with some uh, guy that told us that he played a uh, an Asba drum, vintage Asba drum from the '60s in Guinea, yeah. in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's cool, man. I mean, yeah. it's it's interesting how you find certain things where it was all the distribution. It was like that's where it went at that point in time. Um, but like here, it's like there's certain brands that like, it's really rare to find like, like with a British brand, like Heyman drums or something, mm -hmm. you don't really find them unless it's someone who specifically ordered it from that time. Uh, and I guess similar with Asba, obviously, which I think it's even more uncommon to like go into a, like you don't go into like a thrift shop and you find, because you, you find Ludwig's all the time at like a, you know, secondhand store. I'm trying to think what you guys probably have something different where they'll just be on the shelf and it'll be, they don't know what they have and it's really cheap. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen with Asba drums. Uh, they just kind of, you know, someone sells their stuff. Here's an Asba. But uh, before we get to the 60s and 70s, you guys have, and I'm on your timeline here. Don't let me jump ahead. But you started to work with uh, like Elvin Jones and some great jazz players. How did that happen? We had um, a good team of, I think, 55 people working at ASBA in France. And um, we had people traveling to the States uh, to show the products, uh, you know, because it was, like we said before, a, you know, a, a different world. So you had to go there to bring a snare, you know, a pedal or something, and just to show people, you know, this is a French brand. And usually um, bigger names like Ludwig, would take over, uh, for example, the Caroline bass drum pedal from Asba and would sell it, you know, under their license. So people would not know that that was a French brand. They would know, they would think, you know, yeah. it was like a, a Ludwig bass drum pedal, literally. So, so yeah. by this, you know, kind of stuff, of course, um, we attracted uh, more and more artists. And little by little, we built, you know, an audience and demand. And so that's how uh, we built also, you know, the, the artist roster like for, for Asba. And it, it was from what we heard, because, you know, it's like back in now 50 years ago, even 70 years ago, back in the 50s. And, uh, but we had great calls with the people that, you know, are still there and know everything about the brand. And they know more than anyone and uh, they have great stories and they tell us how it, this happened, how I was talking about the Caroline based drum pedal, but they explained to us how they did that, you know, but this of course brought a lot of uh, commitments to artists and these artists wanted to play as bad because it was cool. It was different. Um, totally. and, I th and, and I think nowadays drummers, and the, the community of drummers that are always looking for something different, innovative. And, uh, and that's why we have also artists from all over the world. So, yeah. 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 I mean, different. We all love different, but it's got to be good, which clearly it was. Um, so that's interesting about the Ludwig thing, because also Ludwig would be distributing like Peisty symbols. And that's how mm -hmm. that would get to the States and things like that. So it's an interesting um they're huge. It's a distribution channel, uh, yeah. which, which makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you real quick, Saul, uh, when did it switch from snare drum to making drum sets? Well, actually, it was 
almost in the same time because they were not doing really drums at all or snare drums. So I think that everything started with the snare, the revelation snare. And after that, they start doing drums too because they knew that people were asking for drums too. But that was also after the World War and during the 50s, knowing that the drums was like this drum fever, you know, with jazz and all these new gen music genres that was coming, that were coming to France. So uh, they decided to start doing drums back at the time. That it was actually um, Alfred, with, if I'm right, uh, Damon, uh, yeah. Marc Perrin. That was, yeah. Marc Perrin, yeah. Hmm. Jacques Perrin was the nephew of uh, Alfred Bouda. Jack Perrin, yeah. And uh, his son, Marc Perrin, uh, took over the commercial stuff and and just, you know, they, the company just, you know, strived to, to do things better and better. And at some point they were selling internationally and, and shipping everywhere. So so that's why you, wow. you find, like, he was, he was giving the example of uh, the African uh, <laughs> drum set lost over there and just, still being played it's it's amazing but yeah. uh, when i was living in the in the states uh i used to meet people uh, and i used to go in stores where they had like literally the the drawer with you know with the asba signs on it just because they used to sell you know the parts for the pillars or this kind of stuff or lugs wow and so so there, there's a history there and, and it's, of course we're talking about drum history so That's perfect. <laughs> But there's, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff like that where you meet people and they know the drum, the brand, like f by heart. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Was there a lot of competition in France? Are th at the time, were there other French drum builders um, making drum sets? Yeah, we had the uh, Capel. Yeah, yeah, they were. Oh, yeah, okay. Capel. Capel, yeah, yeah you, you know them. Uh, Capel. Yeah. Um, I think we had another one, uh, but maybe not mm. as you know um, popular as Asba. But I, I assume there were other brands, other maybe you know artisan, you know that. Or, yep. But uh, well, I, the bigger I, ones were Asba and Capel back at the time. You had all their small ones that I don't really remember the name. Sure. Uh, but the, like the ones that were representing more like the Asba manufacturer, well, Asba drum manufacturers back at the time was more Asba and Capel. And That then, you know, mm. you had the UK, of course, yeah. uh, and Premier, and of course, yep. there was very competitive. So, and with the Beatles and stuff, you know, it was even more than uh, hard, but we were lucky enough to have, you know, Ringo playing the, the congas uh, at the Abbey Road studio, uh, the ah. Asba congas. And so that helped for the reputation of the brand, knowing that one of the Beatles was just playing Asba, you know, even if it was not drums, that was still something recorded on the albums and it brings, you know, some, you know, something <laughs> for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the Ringo effect. It is like what he taught, what they touch yeah. just, and, and it's, it's funny you mentioned that because they're really cool looking congas. It's like the two tone, Yes. The different colors. It's very, very yes. cool. And uh, that instrument that they play becomes a part of history, without a doubt. You know, yeah. just across the world, it becomes famous. Of so, course. Well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I have to say that to the uh, the owners, like the old owners. Yeah. <laughs> We didn't yeah. know anything yeah, yeah. for that. <laughs> But no, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was well, yeah. well done. Taking for taking sure. credit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so now it says on your timeline in 1956, Asba installed a foundry in its workshop to produce shells and small parts in two ovens. Mm. That doesn't happen today. People no. aren't installing foundries. No, it's impossible. No. You, don't, you, you, no. you do that, but with you know subcontractors with China or well, I mean Asia. Uh, yeah, but, Taiwan. But, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, Taiwan. Taiwan but yeah. It's, it's not. No, this doesn't happen. Unfortunately, we we, we lost that. And then it says the dermaplastic skins are manufactured in its workshop. So you guys are making drum heads too. Yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, everything. A to Z, like you said. Drum heads, the hoops, the lugs, the screws, whatever you think about the the part on the snare drum, we would have made it. You know, everything. Yeah. Which is interesting because 1958, it says the dermaplastic skins. It's very debated. But the history of the plastic drum heads is kind of always 
Chick Evans, Remo Belly, who invented it. But in 58, you guys were creating plastic drum heads. So you guys figured it out pretty quick, you know, yeah. and how to how to produce them. Th- yeah. that, that's true. It's uh, it's uh, it was groundbreaking, you know, because like you said, you know, we were like in advance a little bit in a way. Uh, I don't believe all the competitors were making their own drum heads or maybe they, they would ask Remo or, you know, events to, you know, yeah. just to, to stamp the, you know, the brand's name, like, like nowadays, uh, pretty much. Sure. And also back at the time, as bad was pretty known because he was, they were pretty innovative with all the things that they were doing. So it was actually one of the biggest image of the brand, the innovations that they were doing with each of the instruments. So yeah, where yeah. yeah, they were ahead of their time with a lot of things. Absolutely. And it's a family brand, which I think is neat. So it's still at this point remains a family brand through the fifties. And, uh, I'm assuming, did it ever get, well, we will get there, but did it ever get sold or does it still remain a family brand today? No, it, it, it closed, it closed down, uh, in 1983. Uh, that's right. Okay. And, and yeah. then it was a totally different. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, it's a good run, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. So, um, all right. Jumping ahead to the 1960s. What happened in the 60s? Because on the timeline, it's listed as the star years. Um, and just to start off, it says the shells were converted to international measurements. So explain that a little bit. We've heard mm-hmm. it on various episodes, but explain that a little bit for starters. Since we were making our own drum heads, um, we had, the, you know, in France, Europe, we used the metric. And so yep. obviously our drums were also, you know, metric. So it was kind of hard to, to compete also with other drum heads brands, uh, you know, to swap drum heads. You couldn't put a Remo drum head on an Asba drum set because it was a different sizes. It was kind of like, you know, one inch different, like what, a half inch. I don't know exactly, but we had yeah, to, sure. to get internationally, you know, um, we had to set up something for the for the war really and uh, that's why we took you know uh, the example of um, the american sizes uh, and the inch and we started from zero at, at some point uh, so that's why sometimes yeah. in the vintage world of drums you find uh, metric uh, drum sets and uh, that's really hard to to find nowadays with the with the origin original drum head you know it's it's pretty pretty heavy yeah. <laughs> to find Actually, something that happens pretty often, well, not pretty often, but we do have these type of questions is that if we still do drum heads with metric um, uh, dimensions, because there's still a lot of people here in France that do have like as old as the drum sets sure. from the 50s and 60s. And uh, we don't do metric drum heads anymore, but it's something that we have had before. Yeah, I mean, it's come up in other episodes where it's it's the, the pre-international phase mm-hmm. where now, I mean inches metric it could have gone either way but like it it's one of those things where it had to be one uh type of measurement because when you get drums from uh japan and you know different countries it's it's uh we had to be unified so it it makes sense because to pay for a specific custom head for one drum and each each different drum it's not practical uh, no, you no. know, but it, but it was a big decision, you know, like, uh, changing all that. It, I mean, you know, factory wise, you know, that just thinking about changing everything and maybe stopping, you know, to, to, to make the, the drum heads. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's a lot to reconsider, uh, at some point, like, uh, yeah. in terms of business and, and also in terms of, you know, imagine like if today we would change, if all the drummers in the world had to change the sizes of the, you know, the drum heads, that would be a mess. And that happened yeah. back in the day in France and people, you know, have bought a drum set would have to change either the drum set or just buy, you know, the old drum heads and quite wow. tricky, quite tricky. <laughs> yes. But you had to do it. There has to be a point yeah, of like, of all right, this yeah. is going to be uncomfortable for a little bit, but we mm-hmm. have to switch. And I'm sure there were yeah, people completely. who were like, why are we switching to their sizes? They should be switching to our sizes. Exactly. Why is Asba doing yeah. this? And then yeah. it's like, who, you, 
you can't please everyone. Yeah, it was a good strate strategic decision back at the time uh, because there was also the other brands that we were saying, the French brands, that they didn't adapt that much to the international measurements back at the time. And uh, they closed down actually in the 60s. I don't remember the names exactly, uh, but Asba was actually staying more in the market because of the innovation and also the fact that he was adapting more to the international market back at the time. Sure. Yeah. All right. So talk about, though, the drum sets and some highlights that happened in the 60s. Uh, it says you guys had a new hi-hat. You had the two-tone congas made of mahog mahogany and lemon wood, which we talked about a little bit with, with Ringo. But uh, yeah, what's going on in the 60s? So we, we built more and more uh, drums, uh, more and more series. Uh, we tried different uh, wood textures, uh, different, you know, um, combination of, of wood, you know, because back in the day, um, the most popular was poplar, uh, I mean, maple, poplar maple for the three ply. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we followed in a way the, the trend, uh, and Ludwig was big on that. Uh, and we kind of follow the, the steps making drums that sound good with the kind of same style, you know, um, but with our own way to, to beat the drums. So that was, again, two different worlds, but the same vision, you know, uh, trying to get a sound that just stands out, but also the finish, you know, that stands out. So we tried different things and there was more at the end of the sixties that we are, uh, we were trying to get, uh, uh, even different texture, like the metal drum set. Uh, and all that. I mean, that, that came after, but that was one of the priorities, you know, back in the sixties, um, end of sixties, seventies, it was really to, to stand out and to find innovating products, um, and new sound in a way, because, you know, we had everything to do it and we had the chance to do whatever we wanted. So, so yeah. here we go. When you make everything yourself, you can do whatever you want and, Exactly. Experiment and, and try very yeah. cool things. The metal ones are awesome. I mean, if you Google like I'm looking over here at my monitor, if you look at vintage Asba drums, I mean, they're just they look well made like mm -hmm. they I've, I've unfortunately never had the pleasure of playing one because, like I said, they don't come up. I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, and there's not Asba drums all over the place here, but mm -hmm. it's just it's a beautiful drum set. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. We, we we pay attention to details. Uh, it's it, it's true. Like we really pay attention to that, um, and you know we have specificities for each drum set. Uh, you know the choice of the tension rods. Everything is you know is thought like all the time. Like we always uh, question ourselves just to make sure is this good or is this going to work. You know because of course we we like what we're doing, but do people like it too? You know, that's a good question. Yeah. We, yeah. we want to make sure that the client, in a way, the drummer, uh, is happy with what he got because making a, you know, making a drum set is, nowadays you can buy, you know, like whatever uh, shell, you know, like a Keller shell or whatever. And you can make your own drum set. You can paint it if you want in whatever colors. But the, the craftsmanship is here, you know, in-house with our secrets of, you know, how to make the drums. And, um, and that's why usually we invite people to come over here and to show them, you know, how we make the drums. Um, so it's very important to, to notice that um, it's all about, you know, the secrets <laughs> in a way. Yeah. So the Caroline pedal. Pedals are deceptively easy concept you know what i mean where you just you play it it's a spring it pulls but there's a lot of innovation that can happen in pedals so um tell us a little bit about the caroline pedal what made it special and unique and then we can get into the ludwig stuff a little more as well but tell us about the caroline pedal well yeah in the 60s actually the pedal was con was made with the collaboration of daniel lumer it's a jazz drummer here in france and he was pretty close with Asba back at the time. So he was helping a lot Asba in the conception of new products. And the Caroline pedal back at the time was pretty innovative in comparison to other pedals uh, with the system that he has. And um, it was actually one of the things that made Asba what it is now. 
is actually the iconic product of the of the of the brand. Even if as but before it was already in like in the United States from other countries, the Caramel Petal was really the product that was being shipped almost everywhere, or well, at least in the countries that they had back in time, and that really made the image of Asba in the drummers in in the United States, for example. That's why they were so well. The, we had big name drummers back at the time playing in in the Caroline like Mitch Mitchell. Uh, and, and then, well, later we can explain the thing with Ludwig, but yeah, it was quite a huge thing. There's a little um, picture of it that has like arrows pointing to all the like features and it's things where it's like heavy duty, super wide footboard for mm -hmm. maximum comfort and durability. It's like you look at older vintage gear sometimes and it's like really thin and kind of like, yeah, you yeah. Just, like, a nice, <laughs> yeah, you're going to break it. Like we all have feet that are like. You know, normal yeah. size feet. Why not have yeah. it be a normal size pedal and a, and a uh, toe stop? Yeah. And I like how it has the top mounted dual clamps for securing the bass drum hoop. So you can you can attach the where it attaches to the hoop, but you're you're messing with it on the top as yeah. opposed to exactly. the bottom where you're where you're yeah. like that's it <laughs> cutting your knuckles yes. and stuff. So pretty cool. It's it's um it's it's a fun fact because um, I talked to Daniel uh, Umer. Um, not a long time ago, and he was explaining to me about the Caroline that basically he wanted to to create a pedal that is very convenient. That was the main purpose of this pedal was convenience. You know, you don't need to, you don't need any, you know, key key tunes, nothing. You just with your yeah. fingertips, you just, you know, you adjust the pedal as you want for your feet. For your, I mean, it's. It was convenient, and it still is. Yeah. And for for this time, you know, we are talking about seventy years ago, um, fifty years ago. Sorry, it's super modern. Like even nowadays, you can't find a pedal or another brand doing this, and it's quite you know fun. I mean, yeah, it's, di it's really different. So yeah, I mean. I have I have one here, by the way, next to me. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, like, with the cap on and everything. Oh, wow. So yeah. for people listening, he's showing the box. You, if you're on YouTube, you can see it. But man, that is awesome. Yeah, you have everything in here. And then put outside. So this is still being, is this new? This is a new one that is still being yeah. produced? Yes. Got yes. It. Yes. It's the, the ratio. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. I mean, convenience. Who are we kidding? We all want to. It's it's not about having. Oh, oh, it's not over engineered. It's not like there's not too much stuff. And and there are great pedals. I have some where you have to use the drum key to tighten at things. But come on, it's easier to just use your fingers. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like Definitely. you say, it's not rocket science. You know, they, they just back in the day they just thought about the, what is more convenient. What can you do with your fingers just to adjust the pedal? So clearly, it. Um, caught on to the point where Ludwig, you know, it, it gained Ludwig's attention, which Ludwig's history really in the big picture dates back to their bass drum pedal. This episode is brought to you by Dixon Drums. I recently got a Dixon Little Rumor drum set and it is great. I wanted a high quality compact kit to fit in my living room with a small footprint. The Little Rumor has been perfect for what I needed. It's an affordable kit that comes in multiple finishes and configurations. I got satin black coal lacquer with the Little Rumor hardware pack and cases, and I'm loving the strength and lightness of the stands and the quality of the pedals and the comfort of the throne. It's just awesome. Learn more at PlayDixon.com and find your local Dixon retailer to get your own Dixon drums. Also, I posted an unboxing video of uh, me opening my Dixon Little Rumor drum set, and I set them up and I played them and uh, gave kind of a review on them. So you can check that out on the Drum History Podcast YouTube channel or at the link in the description of this episode. So thank you to Dixon for sponsoring this episode. You talked about it before, but maybe is there any more info about that relationship with Ludwig and did it go well? And yeah, so we, we unfortunately, we don't have much information and, um, you know, it's, it's quite hard because some people are not from this world anymore and you can't find, you know, unfortunately some information, but, but we know for fact that Ludwig was, uh, had a real interest into the pedal and, yeah. you know, they found it very modern and, 
And that's why they, you know, they just added the, the item to, to the catalog because that was something really new. And, uh, and they sold like, um, sold, I think, um, uh, a thousand a year, like, you know, they, wow. yeah, a thousand a year. Yeah. Yeah. So, Pretty good. In the last year. Yeah. So. I mean, you know, so, so yeah, we don't have much more information, unfortunately for, for Ludwig. Uh, and I don't know how it stopped too. You know, I don't know. Okay. Something maybe Ludwig. I'm totally just making this up, but maybe Ludwig yeah. came out with their own next generation of a pedal. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Look, that took um, over. It's um, possible. Um, yeah. Sometimes you know that's the fun fact in in the you know the drum community and everyone talking. You know, sometimes people think they know. Sometimes you know you're right, you're wrong. Whoever is right or wrong, this is history. And yep. for example. With the symbol uh, boom stand, you know, the boom stand uh, was created by Asba. And I know that I'm saying that right now, and some people are driving and they're like, no, that wasn't Asba. <laughs> that was Tama. Yeah, they would say yeah. Tama also, or Yamaha or something. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But really, like the telescopic, I don't know if you use this terminology, um, yeah, you yeah, know, telescopic. That was Asba. And then Tama added the, the weight on the arm just for the balance. But we were the first. <laughs> this is drum history. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, I know, yeah. but I imagine the person in the car outraged now going, Oh, yeah, no. oh, yeah. Oh, for sure, for sure. He hates me. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. No, but it's it, all right. That's so cool to hear that because it's we're piecing it all together. I think every episode okay. of the show kind of pieces a little bit more together. And I think that's awesome to hear that. So uh, tell us about the 70s. Saul, why don't you take this one? Well, for the 70s, uh, as, as I was saying before, well, the pedal, the current pedal was actually done in the late 60s. So it was more during the 70s where ASBA was even growing even more internationally. Well, the information that we had for back at the time is that ASBA in there was like selling, um, I don't know, almost like 500 kits per year. And like half will be uh, well between Europe and United States, wow. but uh, yeah, the main thing that they were doing was the pedal actually uh, during all the seventies. Then besides that, uh, I'm not sure Damo, if you have something to add. In the seventies, the metal drum set was the groundbreaking innovation. Um, they actually created the these kits just as you know, just it was a shot in the dark again, like. They wanted something different, and um, the band Magma. Uh, do you know the band Magma? It's a French brand. Yes. With Christian Vander. Yes. Christian Vander. Yeah. Vander, exactly. Yeah. He yep. uh, he was uh, just uh, entering the the Asba, you know, artists uh, uh, roster, and and just he, he wanted something different, and so he asked. The guys, you know, the design guys, the how to build a, a drum set with the, you know, chrome all over, you know, as a finish. But it didn't go well, and he wanted something like very boomy, uh, you know, that stands out. And so they created the metal drum set, like full of metal, and that was really like the start, you know, of something big because we were the first uh, brand to create metal drum sets like full metal wow. shells, you know? And that was like metal from, you know, Paris area. It was, everything was French again. So we were in a different world. From that point, it was like very, you know, it was like future, futuristic in a way. Totally. Um, and, and and people were like just blown away because it sounded super good. Uh, as a matter of fact, like some artists in the States uh, that are nowadays endorsed by, by us, uh, like Brian Irving, for example, is an artist, he's a friend, and he had the, the Asba metal drum set from the 70s. Uh, so, you know, this kind of stuff that just brings back memories. And uh, there's so much to say about these kids. Uh, I mean, it's, um, it's one of a kind, and and we, we, we're doing it again nowadays. So that's another story, but um, yeah. Yeah. The research and development that you guys would do as like, 
like someone's job is to just kind of develop new products. It's just wild. I mean, the amount of stuff that you guys would be producing and the time and effort you could put into that. So the company was clearly successful. Oh yeah, making enough money to support people doing this yeah. and selling the drum sets. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Pretty amazing. It, metal drum sets, man. Those are nowadays they're they're relatively common. And there's like Q drums with the very recently late great Jeremy Berman. Um, of course. Yeah. It, it's it's become more more popular now, obviously, but uh, it had to be pretty mind blowing to see this back in in its original days. You know. That's true. Yeah, yeah. When you think fifty years ago was there and still here nowadays. Uh, and to talk about Q, uh, we had the chance to meet uh, Jeremy uh, at NAMM Show 2020. And, uh, you know, I was a big fan of the company because of the artists, first of all. Um, and, you know, when I met Jeremy and Max, uh, <laughs> they were so happy to meet us because they knew us back. Of course, yeah. uh, because of the metal drum set and all that. So that brings back what I said before. Like we were inspired by a lot of brands, uh, and some brands, you know, maybe were inspired by us too. And and it's good to see that, you know, the main purpose of that is just to have something that sounds great and that is well made, and and yeah, that 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 is is all really like it's uh, <laughs> happiness. So yeah. But we're now at a point where everything's going great. Metal drums, you guys are making everything. It's amazing. But pretty soon thereafter, in the early 80s, 83, maybe just describe what happened because it's not uncommon. This is very common of a thing where the world changed them with drums. But what led to being kind of on top of the world with the you know, drum manufacturing and a big, huge, successful company with a bunch of employees? What happened to lead up to closing in 1983? They had different reasons back at the time. And one of the main ones was the competition. It's when there were a lot of Asian brands coming in the market and having like cheaper drums. Uh, and ASBA back at the time wanted to still have these, uh, how do you say it, workshop production in the yeah. sense that they didn't want to uh, have big mass production or they didn't have the means to have it yet. So they didn't take the right decisions back at the time to do more, uh, well, more drum sets in a bigger high, uh, high scale, like uh, Asian brands back at the time. And that's what it led to a closing. There was also other reasons before that, but mainly it was because of the competition back at the time. Yeah, and, and, the, and the company uh, was, you know, not uh, modernizing the machine and, yeah. and everything. So it was... Like like Sao said uh, really well, it was different, you know, circumstances that you know brought the company to close down. But mainly, yeah, the competitivity was was a big thing. Like really, you would get a drum set from from Japan for two thousand francs, you know, uh, and you would get an Asba drum set for seven thousand. Seven thousand. So yeah. you can't compete. That. What do you do? Yeah. Yeah. And still to this day, the world has changed, obviously. Like, exactly. There aren't really companies with a foundry installed in their, you know, warehouse, like workshop. And I get that, though, the, the desire to remain boutique. It's almost like Asba could have gone the way of like Q drums or one of those where, where it was small and they made less kits. But you're so invested, you, but you've been producing drums for so long. It's almost like yeah. there's no, you can't turn it into five employees from however exactly, many you had, yeah. and, which is very sad, but I'm sure, I'm sure it was a, a hit to like the region where the factory was located. I mean, I'm sure people lost their jobs oh, and yeah. it had to be a bad, bad time. Yeah, mm -hmm. For sure. Absolutely. And yeah. I, I actually, um, I met one of the guy that bought the, all the molds, uh, you know, the, the, the pedals molds and, pretty much everything. And, uh, he sold it to, to another guy that melts, <laughs> like literally melts all everything, all the steel and stuff. Just <laughs> so, oh my God. That, yeah, so <laughs> horrible story. So that's yeah. why, uh, when you see the pedal, like, uh, I have the pedal here too. Uh, you know, you see this nowadays and this is exactly, uh, the same pedal that nowadays that before, you know, so, 
Yeah. This is a lot of research and development, like you said. And um, it's also, you know, kind of a pride to be back with it because we bring memories also back, you know, to the nostalgic people and to germers and yep. new generation. So, so yeah, uh, that was a kind of a very messy uh, yeah. era for, for people. For yeah. sure. mm. But for everyone. I mean, yeah. everyone was like so like Slingerland went out of business. Exactly, it, it, yeah. it continued on with like the name sort of, you know what I mean? But like real, the real deal, everyone was hurting. Um, so that is very sad, obviously. But on your website, it says 1984 to 2015 in the cupboards, but also on stage and in the studios. People are still playing them. They still have the older kits, still sound great, still very collectible. What happened then in 2016 when you guys come back? Like, wh what's happening from 2016 until today? So, um, uh, uh, Guillaume Pone, uh, who's the owner of Asba, bought the, the rights uh, in 20, yeah, 2015 or 16? 20, 2016, yeah. 2016, yeah. 2016, 2017, and, yeah. Uh, basically, it was just, uh, you know, prototypes just to see, you know, how this adventure, you know, how far this adventure can go, you know, let, let's give a try. And thing is, they did try uh, some uh, drum shows in Paris and um, bringing this logo uh, back to the audience and to the, 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 the drummers, you know, it was just, uh, you know, it, it, it just happened and people were just super happy to see the brand back. And, uh, the commitment to order new Asba drum set was also the reason why they started to build drums and to hire people and just to make it, you know, to revive it the brand. It can happen, yeah. Uh, and yeah. So, yeah. And, and the thing is that also during all these years that Asba was not active from 83 until 2016, 17, there was still like a big community of Asba lovers back at the time or people that was actually buying Asba kits, like secondhand, secondhand Asba kits. And this brand was still living somehow. Uh, but in the vintage drummer community here in France yeah. and all over Europe. And actually when the brand came out again, and well, they started like, uh, opening or we start opening new shops all over Europe, there were actually a lot of shops that already knew us and they were actually surprised that we were there and they actually love our brand. Just not here in France, like we have some shop, like some partner shops in, in the Netherlands uh, that they actually work pretty well with us and that they had a lot of like vintage uh, Asba drum kits from the 70s. Um, and they were even at some, at some point, they knew even more about us, about some part of the Asba history during the 60s or <laughs> little lover, lovers. Yeah. Yeah. They're very unique. I think for speaking on behalf of like an American as an American drummer, it's just cool. A French drum company. It's very, it's very, because for us, it's like, you know, I don't want to say exotic, but you know what I mean? It's like a different, yeah. we're used to, Lud you're, you, you're used to what you see. We're used to Ludwig and the Japanese brands, Tama Pearl. We're used to all those. So it's really cool to see a French brand with such high quality. The logo is super cool. I think the, the badge and the logo is awesome. I think that's Okay. Probably do that doesn't affect the sound, but I think it's really cool. And <laughs> well, it's, we it's like a whole like thing, that. you know. It's like it's yeah. it, it's chic, you know, in a way. It's like kind of yeah, elegant and very yeah. elegant. That's a good way to put it. I imagine now, though, there's not a factory where you guys are b making your own drum heads and doing all the things that are nowadays would be unnecessary to exactly. some degree. It, I'm sure yeah. it's modernized a little bit in that regard. For sure, yeah, yeah. Now we. We stopped uh, making our own drum heads. Uh, you know, we uh, we have suppliers for the shells. Uh, actually, for for the story, uh, we um, we were supposed to have everything in house to build our own shells. Everything, you know, uh, but COVID happens and <laughs> happened. Sorry, and so yep. this this changed everything. Um, and uh, to be honest and fair with you, like I was at NAMM show 2020 and we were, you know, I mean, we were signing contracts with stores and, you know, we were going to sell drums and build drums 
that was the beginning, like really like Nam show that, that was the, the bootstrap of the future for the brand. Yeah. And it just disappeared in, in a second. And at some point we had to choose, you know, either we invest into everything, the machines and everything and people to build your own shares in house or, you know, you just, you just subcontract with all the, you know, suppliers. So that's what we did. Um, yeah. But that having been said, uh, the shares are just our specificities. It's only ASBA, you know, and sure. su- suppliers, they, they just make shares for us and no one else. So, so that's the very important thing, uh, meaning that one day we will have everything under the same roof here in Lyon and the shares would be, you know, they would remain the same. So the same sound, yeah. everything would be the same. So, so that's very important yeah. to, to uh, highlight because people usually yeah. say, you know, it's not made in France or, you know, it's crap because it's not, you're lying or whatever, but you know, you, you can't, I mean, the hardware is made in Taiwan for every brand. So you, at some point, even yes. if it's made in, you know, whatever, uh, UK or, or the States or, or Japan, there's always, you know, uh, a supplier somewhere. So no making shells or having a distributor like Keller or something. And it, it, it is your specific brand that comes up all the time. Mm-hmm. I think people know that now that it's your mole. It's your, it's your specific uh, formula for your shells mm-hmm. and um, but still in the future go for it good for you guys for oh, making yeah. your shells in house yeah you know? we, we, that's the thing we 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 have the uh, drum builders um, behind the walls there but yeah, they don't actually, speak English so unfortunately it's <laughs> but I speak for I speak for them and you know they, they know how to build drums they know how to make shells they know everything about drums so and they can't wait for for that to happen you know it's a it's a matter of of yeah. timing, I, w- I would say timing instead of time because uh, the company is, is going well despite the you know the whole world going crazy. But we're still yeah. setting yeah. and and you know we hope to to sell even more and and to educate people about the brand. So, well, you guys are great ambassadors of Asba to reach people um, in America, but also people listen around the world. And I think this has been a really cool look at it because. I did not know. I mean, I've looked at your timeline on your website, but I did not know a lot of this. And and there's just something very cool. And I think the fact that it's a French drum manufacturer, even French cars back in the day, something very special and unique about the manufacturing and the design, mm-hmm. uh, which it's it's all uh, it's it's its own thing, French manufacturing. So I think it's really cool that you guys are are back. So congrats to you guys and the whole team. Thank you, um, Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Either of you guys can do it, but why don't you tell people where they can uh, find you online, social media, all that good stuff. If your personal stuff too, if you want to tell them to follow you, whatever. Now's your chance to tell us. Yeah, about it. well, uh, as bad drums, ASBA drums is uh, the main, you know, hashtag to follow on Instagram, on networks. On Facebook, um, yeah. We are on YouTube pretty much. Uh, I think every uh, sound. I think all the other stuff. We're like even TikTok. on TikTok. Whatever. Yeah. TikToking. Yeah. I, well, I we're not really t- TikToking, but we have a TikTok account for the company. It's all dancing to uh, yeah. Like yeah. TikTok. Yeah. But you know, you know, yeah. we have to, you know, to be, you know, to fit this world too. Oh, yeah. uh, unfortunately, yes. I mean, if we could avoid all this marketing, uh, you know, stuff on social network, we would avoid it, and we would focus on other stuff, maybe more important. But nowadays, you need to be seen. And you need to be visible yeah. and, uh, and people yeah. are just on the phone. So if you're not, you know, making people aware of Asba, you know, being back or being new for the new generation, then, you know, you, you get everything wrong. So that's why we, we push toward, you know, more visibility and artists, you know, endorsements and, and all that. Like, you know, John J. Robinson, for example, has his, uh, snare drum, uh, signature model and, this is yeah. something, you know, like, you know, people are not maybe aware of that, but we need to to mention it somehow. Yeah, that's a great one. And you have a cool video on your uh, YouTube channel of the Drumeo guys opening J.R. Yes. Robinson's uh, oh, yeah. snare drum, mm-hmm. exactly. which, well, I mean, let's rewind a little bit. And maybe before we wrap up, what, what happened with that partnership? 
with him because, I mean, he's an American icon record on every album and recording ever. How did that come about working with him? Well, uh, basically, that was all about the Caroline bass drum pedal. I contacted him um, about the, the the pedal because he used it for most of his, you know, let's say 70s to 80s uh, recordings. And uh, he loves the pedal. Like, he really, he's really dear to the pedal. He recorded the, the Michael Jackson of the wall and bed wow. with his pedal. And I didn't know that. And, you know, for me, for us at Asba, it's a big thing because you wouldn't think this French product, you know, traveled, you know, the, the Atlantic Ocean to the Ocean. Right in LA and to be played there yeah. and recorded. You know, I mean, it's amazing, you know. There's so much, yeah. I mean, th- this is, this is awesome for us. And, um, so it was really dear to the pedal, but back in the day, that was like two years ago, I think already, um, we didn't have the pedal yet. And so, um, you know, we did some, well, that, that was during COVID. So we did some videos, we called each other many times and, uh, we ended up creating the, the top lug, which is the snare drum with the floated uh, lugs. Uh, we had the ID and we suggested um, JR to be the ambassador for this specific snare drum and he accepted. Um, you know, he's, he's a DWU guy. We all know that. Yeah. But sure. he can um, assign, you know, snare drums, the one he wants really. So he was happy to contribute to Asba's history and to move totally. forward with us, you know, so, and cannot wait to, to play the, the Caroline bass drum pedal again. Uh, yeah. And the double, also the double pedal. Oh, yes. cool. We have, double we have, Caroline. Well, we have, yeah, double Caroline, so the twins. <laughs> we, yeah. we, we, we have this in, in mind for, for later. Uh, I mean, sooner than yeah. later, but, but that's the thing that yeah. really, it's requested by a lot of people. A uh, cool sure. thing. We, yeah. I have the prototype of the GR top plug in here. So here I'm showing the prototype of the GR snare. Well, we cannot see exactly the logo in here because it's a prototype, but you can see the logs that it's a pre-system float system that you can just, if you have a key, you can just move it each log gotcha. in the in the ring and it's for both sides actually. So wow. you can find a lot of sounds, uh, different sounds with this snare. Like yeah. something that we say pretty often is that this snare can replace couple of snares, depending on what sound you're looking for. Uh, and also, well, one video that we, well, they did online that is pretty good explaining everything is the video from Sounds Like a Drum about yes. the snare. Yeah. So yeah, this is a prototype and pretty cool, but this is not the real color. This is a bl- black color. The real one is more like uh, chocolate, I will say, perhaps. Sure. But yeah, this was the first yeah. one, sir. You're looking to the first top log. Uh, snare. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, the, the Sounds Like a Drum video was very cool. I was watching that last night. Ben and Cody over there, they did a great job oh, yeah. with it. Um, mm. I mean, yeah. but what you guys said about, you know, you wish you could just make drums and not worry about the marketing stuff as much, but this is our world. Everyone's online. Like exactly. what, Literally what you're doing right now with me is to reach people and tell them. Because oh, it's, yeah. it's like if you don't yeah. have commercials or stuff... People think you don't exist. It's just how the world is now. So, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I think you guys have done a very good job as ambassadors. I'll put the uh, the links in the description for everything Asba. Um, but on that note, guys, I think this was a great one, and I'm honored to have you on the podcast and uh, to you know for, to share the story with everyone else. And uh, before we before I forget, I want to mention. I have had uh, at least two people contact me and say, hey, you should do an episode on Asba. Oh, really? So thank you to my friend Nate Testa, who's the official snare geek yeah. on uh, Instagram. Who Man, Nate is killing it. I mean, he has a huge following now. Yeah. I remember hanging out with him, eating pizza for breakfast at the Chicago drum show, and like we were still <laughs> trying to grow it. And uh, Nate is killing it. So, uh, And then also Eric McKnight, who suggested it, I believe, through my uh, Patreon account. So thank you to Eric and uh, Nate, who both requested ASBA episodes. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Well, Demo, Saul, 
I've had a pleasure talking to you guys, and uh, thank you so much for being here. And hopefully, we can meet someday at a drum show or sure. something like that. Are you doing yeah, the sure. NAM show or Chicago drum show? I'll be at Chicago. I've yeah. never been to NAM. NAM is like the other side of the country for me, and it's yeah, like it's, it's too far. Yeah, it's yeah. just so expensive. And I'm like, I go and I walk around for three days and leave, and I'm like, all right, well, yeah. Now I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel too much noise. Sure. Also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. Well, thank you guys for being here. Uh, thank you. Likewise, thank you for, for inviting the us. Time and yeah. the consideration. We really, really appreciate that.